We're gonna finish up the series we're in this weekend and we've got a lot to do and a lot of ground to cover and I hope you're ready regardless of how you feel about Jesus. I think there's something for all of us and this series has been a conversation about how there's confusion, there's misunderstanding, there's, there's actually times where we're wrong about the idea of Christianity and what it means to be a Christian. In fact, the, the term and concept of Christianity and Christian, there are so many definitions out there and so much confusion that in some ways the words have become hollow and we have to go back and define them and say, hey, this is what we're really talking about. And when we just said that there are many times that when we're having conversations with people, we actually come to a place where we go, yeah, that, that's not Christianity. And we said, let's work through that to say what's not Christianity and what is Christianity. And here's been what we've been trying to do the whole series. You can find this uh, on your notes. We said, let's pursue clarity and correction by trying to define what is and what is not Christianity. Let's pursue clarity and correction. Let's make sure that we really do know what is true, what really is false. Let's get after it, understand it, be able to put words to it, and maybe along the way be corrected. Regardless of if we'd say we're a Christian or not, we'd be able to say, yes, I really get clarity to understand uh, and get corrected on how to understand what is or what is not a follower of Jesus. And we've dealt with some incredibly big topics, and I don't have time to review them. So go back, go to the website, go to the app, catch up, listen to those, watch those. We trust that it'll be uh, valuable. This weekend... As we finish, we're gonna, again, we're gonna try to do a lot. And let me try to frame it this way. Uh, I want you to imagine you're a parent. You've raised your child for 18, 19 years, whatever it is, and now you're taking them off to college. And you've been in the car and you're headed two, three, four, five hours away. You're getting ready to drop them off to college. And as you're on your way there to the school, you as the parent feel this, this pressure. Did I prepare them? Are they going to know what to do? Have I set them up? Are, are they able to make the kind of decisions that they need to make? And you start to feel a little bit of anxiety and you start to feel like, man, I need to say some things in this moment because I'm not gonna get this moment back and I need to make sure that I articulate these things because I wanna be able to sleep well at night. I wanna be able to have confidence that they're prepared. So you just start going through the list. You, you, know, you know that mom and dad love you, right? And no matter what you do, we're here for you and we're safe. You know that, right? You, you, you remember that I put the jumper cables in the, in, the, in the car for you that we brought and you get and grab those. You remember how to change a tire. We worked through that, right? You're not just gonna eat junk food. You're gonna, we're gonna put some colorful stuff on your plate, right? You're gonna, you're gonna do that. You, you are gonna go to class. Well, we're paying a bunch of money. You're, you're gonna go to class. Please choose good friends. Hey, make sure you find a church. And you go through this and you just start talking and you just start going and they're kind of nodding their head and they're, they're feeling it and, and they kind of look at you and they say, why, why do you feel this urgency? And you're like, because I just want to know I've said it. I just want to know I've put it out there. I just want to make sure that you understand it. And in those moments, it feels so important. Here's, here's what we do, right? Here's what we do. We say as much as we can, as fast as we can, even though it won't be the best we can say it. We say as much as we can, as fast as we can, even though we know it won't be the best that we'll say it. It's the last moment before you send the team out on the field for the big game. It's, it's the last moment before you let your child drive in the car by themselves for the first time and you say all the things that you need to say. It's the moment before you go on the trip overseas and you make sure all the details and you say as much as you can, as fast as you can, even though you might not say it the best that you can. This weekend, what I wanna do, because I wanna be able to sleep well at night, is I wanna say some things in some ways as much as I can, as fast as I can, even though it's not gonna be the best that I can. And I wanna cover a variety of, a variety of these topics that are not Christianity, and really try to explain what Christianity is so that I can feel like, yep, we, we talked about that. And I'm not gonna get to every part of every topic and, and there's probably some things I'm gonna leave on the table and you're gonna say, why didn't you say that? And, and I just wanna say as much as I can, as fast as I can, even though it's not the best that I can, so that at least I can say, I talked to you about that. Because there are some parts of this conversation that I just wanna make sure that you go, yeah, I've thought through this. Again, whether you're a Christian or non-Christian, some of these things just kind of creep into our soul and we need to process them to make sure we truly understand what is really going on. And so that's my heart, that I wanna to try to work through these almost like we were having coffee together. 
and you were just able to ask me questions and I would just rapid fire go through these questions and talk almost, almost as though we're just counting back and forth and I just rapid fire work through these things. And, and, and before I do, I wanna, I wanna set the stage of, again, why this is so important. And in so many ways, these couple verses that we look at, they actually, they actually frame why this whole series has been so important and why clarity and correction are necessary. I'm gonna be in a lot of different places in scripture this weekend and I'm gonna break some rules for even the way I normally preach. And, and so just hang with me and jot them down. But there's a couple places I do want you to make sure that you've seen some notes, all right? So, or you've seen some scripture. So two places I want you to go. First one, go ahead and turn on or turn to 2 Timothy chapter two. 2 Timothy chapter two. And I wanna set the stage for this conversation that we need to bring clarity and correction to. And in 2 Timothy chapter two, this is again, Paul, this man who's been changed by Jesus. He hated, he hated Christians, didn't want anything to do with Christianity, meets Jesus personally, begins to be just moved by the spirit of God to make the church and the name of Jesus become famous. And, and as he begins to preach and help start churches, he's, he's training up future leaders. And one of those leaders that he's training up is this man named Timothy. And Timothy's a, a pastor, a leader. And, and he's talking to him about things that he needs to understand in his ministry. And as he's talking with them, he gives some final instructions in this letter called 2 Timothy. And he's talking to him about the importance of staying connected to the truth of God's teachings. And here's what he says in 2 Timothy chapter two, ver, uh, chapter four, I'm sorry, chapter four, verse two. Preach the word. He says, whatever you do, preach truth. Make sure that you tell people what God really says. Make sure that you bring what we now know is the scriptures to bear on the conversation. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct and rebuke and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. So it, w- it would be like me looking at some of our residents or some of our other pastors and I'm like, hey, whatever happens, just preach the Bible. Tell them the truth. Make sure you preach the word. Make sure you make sure that you stick to this and whatever you're gonna say, you go back to this. And Paul says to Timothy, hey, make sure that you're ready in season, out of season, that you stick to the word and preach it. And then Paul gives us a really clear like, and this is why you need to make sure you preach the word. So here's what he says. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. He says there's a time coming when when people will be confused and they'll think things are true that are not true. And actually when you teach them the truth, they'll push back and they won't like it and they won't wanna hear it and they'll send you emails and there'll be Twitter wars about it and people will go crazy because people don't wanna hear the truth and they don't want sound doctrine. So he says, make sure you keep preaching the truth. Make sure you stick with the word because the time is coming where people will say, we really don't wanna hear that anymore. And he says, but no, stay with it. And then he continues to build on that. Instead, They'll have a different motive to suit their own desires. They'll gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. Just pause before I go any further. Listen to me, this is crazy and be be aware of this. I've watched people in our church drift from good theology because their kids have rejected a certain theology. And suddenly, this is crazy, they love their kids more than they love the truth. And the only way to reconcile those is to punt on the truth and go chase their kids. And he says, what happens in that moment is you just start to hear what you wanna hear. You surround yourself with people who will affirm it. You find the site on the webs, on the internet that goes, yeah, that's right, it doesn't really mean that. He says, don't do that. And he says, when people look for those things and they surround themselves with people who just, their itching ears wanna hear, he says, they will turn their ears away from the every campus say this word with passion, with truth. They'll turn away from the truth and instead they'll turn to myths. And we'll find ourselves in a culture believing things that we have to stop and say, yeah, that's not Christianity. Even in the church, yeah, that's not Christianity. You, you have bought into something that's it's pop psychology. You might even seen it or heard it in a church. You might've read a book written by a Christian, but it's actually not Christianity. It's a myth. And we said, no, we need to make sure that we preach the word and get after understanding what really is Christianity. And it's interesting as we consider this, Nothing surprised Jesus as the church was released into the world. And so as you maybe hold your mind and thoughts to what Paul has just taught us here in 2 Timothy, flip backwards in your Bible to the Gospel of John, to the Gospel of John chapter 17. And 
And again here, Paul has just said to Timothy, make sure you, you preach the word in season, out of season. Otherwise people will drift and they won't want sound doctrine and they'll, they'll turn from the truth to myths. Well, Jesus knew that this was gonna be a propensity for, for people in the church world, people who followed him. Jesus in John chapter 17, it's a famous chapter because Jesus prays for different groups of people. He prays for himself and prays for the world and he, he prays for the church. He prays for Christians. He actually prayed for, for us if you're a follower of Jesus. And in that prayer in John 17, he, he said something that, that, that really is driving this entire conversation and the urgency to say as much as we can, as fast as we can, even though we might not say it the best. In John 17, verse 16, as Jesus is praying for us, he says about Christians, they're not of the world. There's a lot that could be said here, but Jesus is just reminding us in this prayer that he prayed that, that the disciples would have heard. He's saying, hey, I wanna remind you, the people who follow me, they're in the world, but they're not of the world. They're different. They're not shaped and driven and they don't think the way the rest of society thinks. In fact, I'm not of that either and they follow me. And then he continues and he says this, instead, Father God, what I need you to do is I need you to sanctify them, sanctify, set them apart, change them. Sanctify is the theological word for people, normal people like you and me, becoming like Jesus, being made holy, being set apart to be different, being refined, being shaped, being changed, to be defined and directed by the thoughts and directions of Jesus Christ. And he says, I need you to change them, to shape them, to sanctify them. And how will you do that? You'll do that by truth. Remember, Paul said, hey, they'll turn from truth to myths. And he says, they need to be sanctified, changed, shaped, directed by truth. And then he says this, this is awesome, ready? And your word is truth. Your word is truth. We know scripturally that the word is actually in some ways twofold. It's personal. The word is the person of Jesus Christ. In the beginning was the word and the word was God and the word was with God and the word became flesh. But we also know the word of God is the scripture. As the heart of this series, and I said this in week one and coming back, is that the way you continually are able to know the truth is that you get to know the truth. That you keep coming back and you go, what does the scripture say? Not what did the book I read from, this, from Amazon tell me? Not even what did Pastor Keith say? What's the scripture say? He says, what will shape them? What will sanctify them? What will keep them from turning to mist? What will keep them on a godly, a godly path? What will keep them chasing what they should chase? That they'd be sanctified by truth and your word is truth. Maybe a way to say this, friends, this weekend is that when we think about this entire series and what I wanna popcorn through this weekend is that there's a skill that I'm trying and our teaching team's trying to teach you in this series and it's that you would be so connected to the truth, here's what you'd be able to do. You would know the truth so that you could say no to the lies. You would know the truth so that you could say no to the lies. You, you know this, that people who, I've used this illustration many times, people who work to understand counterfeit money, they don't, listen to me, they don't study counterfeit money, they study the real thing. So that when they look at it, when people want to know is art real, they study the real art. You know that you can tell when your kids are lying if you study their patterns because you can pick up on when they tell the truth and what it sounds like and what their eyes and face does and when they're lying because you know the truth so you can say no to the lies. The whole point of this series is to keep coming back going, the world's saying, the world's saying, they're saying, they're saying, is that true? Is that not true? I got to know the truth so I can say no to the lies. And this is why it's so important because the lies are gonna kill you but the truth is gonna set you free. The lies are gonna kill you and choke you out. They're gonna promise you things that they'll never deliver on but the truth will set you free. So as a community of faith, as a group of believers, Christians need to know what is true and what is false, what is true and what is a myth. How do we do that? We would be sanctified by the word. This is why we, we preach from the word. This is why we say, get in groups with the word. This is why we say, read the word on your own. We're, we're not trying to be religious. We're trying to say part of being sanctified is the truth of the word of God. So you could know the truth and you could say no to the lies. This is what we've been trying to do because we wanna set you free as you understand the truth so well. All right, so with that in mind, 
I wanna work through four different topics, four different realities that we would say, yeah, that's not Christianity, but yeah, this is Christianity and work through and say, this is the lie, this is the truth. And how do we get our minds and our hearts around these? And again, I'm gonna speak as fast as I can about as much as I can, even though it won't be the best that I can, but I wanna make sure that you hear these. First one, I'll start it off this way. Um, Sometimes if I'm with people and we're playing a game, golf, basketball, some type of events going on, and I catch a break. Ball skips out of the sand and into the fairway. Ball bounces off the defender and back to me, and ball goes to the rim and goes around the rim and off the backboard and then in. The car stops right before me when it looked like it was gonna hit me or whatever it is, inevitably. People will look at me, both Christians and non-Christians, and they'll say some version of this. Boy, you must be living clean. Isn't it? You must be living clean. Oh, you're probably blessed because you're living clean. They paint this picture in their head that the reason that happened was almost some version of, big word, karma. Oh, you're a pastor, you're a Christian, you, you're doing the right thing, so the right thing's gonna happen back to you. You did the good thing, so the good thing's gonna happen back to you. The reason that ball got out of the sand trap is after all, you're a pastor. (laughs) Which I can tell you, my ball ends up in the sand trap a lot and I'm a pastor. But there's almost this idea that if we walk with Jesus, chase the things of God, do the right things, everything will just work out. And some of us, even in Christianity, have bought into this. In fact, here's what I wanna say to you is not Christianity. Yes, this is not Christianity, but it's what some of you think. And here's what it is, ready? I should expect good in return for the good I do. I should expect good in return for the good I do. I mean, after all, Keith, doesn't the Bible say you reap what you sow? I mean, isn't the idea that we would kind of put blessings out there so blessings would come back? You wake up at the right time of night, someone will preach that to you. Just do the right stuff. I mean, heck, sometimes they put money to it. Give this, you're gonna get tenfold, a hundredfold, a thousandfold. You do good, you're gonna get good in return. We preach and we teach, and some of us believe, Christian and non-Christian, that there's this cosmic karma out there that if I just do the right thing, then the ball will fall where it should fall and the money will come and the things will be right. And yet I just, I just wanna show you two scriptures and I could show you a litany that would tell you, yeah, this is not Christianity. <laughs> two scriptures that I'll just put up and then I'll give you a couple thoughts to consider about, all right? This is from John chapter 16, verse 33. I've told you these things, Jesus talking to the disciples before he ascends, telling them the Holy Spirit's gonna come. He says, I've told you these things that in me you may have peace. And why is it that they would need peace? I'm glad you asked. Next sentence, ready? Because in this world, you will have trouble. Jesus says, you're gonna follow me and here's what I can guarantee will happen even when you do good, even when you do right, you will have trouble. Now, he gives them hope in the next sentence. He says, but don't worry, take heart. I've overcome the world. There's victory and hope in the middle of that trouble. Let me make something really clear before I even tell you what the truth of Christianity is. God never promised the absence of trouble in your life. What he promised was his presence in the middle of that trouble. But there is a reality that just because you do good and just because you serve Jesus and just because you step up and just because you write the check and you work with students and you're serving God and you're in and you're praying and you're reading your Bible, bad stuff's not gonna happen, that's a lie. You will have trouble. I'm not saying God doesn't want to bless you. I'm not saying God's not a good father. I'm not, I said as much as I can, as fast as I can. Can't get to all of it, but listen to me. I'm not saying God's not for you. He is, but in this world, you'll have trouble. In fact, I'll just show you one other verse which may even be harder to read in some regards. This is what it says in 2 Timothy chapter uh, 3, verse 12. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Some of you are like, the last thing I want is persecuted. I get it. Don't follow Jesus then. Because it is not Christianity to believe that if you do good, you will get good automatically on the backside. In fact, I will tell you, if you read the Bible cover to cover, here's actually what you should expect as a part, not the whole, but as a part of Christianity. Ready? Suffering and trial are to be expected. They're to be expected. 
The Christian should never be shocked about suffering and trial. Why? Because we know the world's blown up by sin. We know that it's a mess. We know that we're dysfunctional. We know that everything's dysfunctional. We know that creation moans. And by the way, if you think I'm crazy and you're like, no, Keith, I don't think that's true. God wants to bless us. And if we do good, we'll do good back. Here's what I'll tell you, all right? This will just make my point for me. There's only been one person on planet earth who always did good, who always got it right, who made every decision and did everything he could to honor and love and serve people. And you know what happened to him? They crucified him on a cross. If there was anyone who did good that good should have come back for, it should have been Jesus. He got betrayed by his friends. He got sold out for money. He got beaten and flogged and a crown of thorns and died. I am telling you, Jesus is the example that just because you do good does not mean life is gonna be good. Now, great news, he overcomes the grave and he wins and he gives us his presence and his spirit to be in us to overcome this suffering and trouble. But some of you, the reason you're not a Christian is you think that Christians believe that if we're Christians, everything will be good. And you've seen that there are Christians whose life isn't good. So you think we're liars. So you say you're out for others. You were a Christian, but you walked away from Christianity because you did good and good didn't come because no one told you the truth. That part of Christianity is suffering and trial. In fact, I'll go further. If you don't have any suffering and trial in your Christian life and you say you're a Christian, you're probably not doing it right. And I would also say that I am so over so many of us in this culture calling things suffering and trial that actually aren't suffering and trial compared to what the rest of the world of Christianity is dealing with. Some of us who are American Christians need to grow a spine and some grit. But the reality is you sign up to walk with Jesus. It is not rainbows. It is not perfect. It is not always gonna be great. And what I'm telling you is you need to know the truth so you can say no to the lies. And one of the lies is if you do good, good's automatically coming. It's just not true. I know some incredibly godly people who got cancer and died. I know some incredibly generous people who lost their job. I know some incredibly benevolent, forgiving people who their spouse walked out on them. Suffering and trial is to be expected. It is a part of a fallen world. It is also part of the reason we have so much joy and so much hope that we know there's a day coming where there's no more pain, no more suffering, and no more tears. But right now we need to say yes to the truth so we can say no to the lies. It is not Christianity to believe if I do good, good is coming. What Christianity says is suffering and trial are a part of it. I would take a sip of my coffee and I'd give you a chance to ask a question and we would go to question two. Question two you might ask me is, hey Keith, as I've been processing some things, you know, I've heard people say that religion is supposed to be like, like deeply personal and private. I mean, maybe you grew up in a home where someone told you, you don't talk about you don't talk about religion. I grew up in a home where one of the statements amongst our extended family was when you're with them, you don't talk about religion and politics. It was just what, like, it was, it was rude. In fact, the idea that you would talk about religion with people was like cruel and insulting and who are you and arrogant. And after all, at the end of the day, people would say, I mean, it's just about me and God anyways. And so there's this idea that people say, when it comes to faith, it's, it's just about you and your relationship with the divinity and your relationship with the most high. And so we don't really need to talk about that at all. In fact, I wanna tell you something that is not Christianity, that here's what I'm gonna, I'm gonna get on some Christians because you think this and it's not true. This is not Christianity, ready? Here's what it is. Faith should be a private thing. That's what some of you think. It's certainly what a lot of non-Christians would say. We'd say faith should be a private thing which is a whole nother conversation. If we had more time over that coffee, we would talk about how that's really not when you think something's important, it's not private, and we'll get to that here in a second. But, but you would say faith should be a private thing. And even some of you Christians, you're like, yeah, I'm a Christian, I follow Jesus, but faith should be a private thing. I mean, it's just me, and I'm not supposed to like push that on anyone. I'm not supposed to go after anyone. It's just between me and God. Faith should just be a private thing. And yet here's what I just wanna jump to the chase and say, that's not what the Bible says. You gotta know the truth so you can say no to the lies. And if you are a part of our church this weekend, you're at a campus, you're online, you're paying attention, or you watch this at some point in the future, and you think you can be, 
You think you can be a Christian and all you care about is your relationship with God and no one else's relationship with God, you are not being a Christian. Romans, Paul talking to the church in Rome about what it means to live out their faith. And he says this in Romans chapter 10. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? How can any person call on the one they haven't believed in? They don't believe in him. How can they call out to him? And then he continues to build his argument. And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard. Well, that's hard. I mean, that's a tough process for them to praise and worship the one that they don't know and they won't know him if they haven't heard about him. And then he keeps going and he says, and how can they hear without someone preaching to them? Well, how will they know unless someone tells them? And then he comes and he says, and how could anyone preach unless they're sent? Which is interesting because Jesus says to those of us who are followers of him, just as I was sent, you are sent. And then Paul, he lands a plane here and he says this, as is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Yeah, it is not Christianity to say that faith is a private thing, but here's what Christianity is, ready? Following Jesus is personal, but it's not private. And even beyond that, it's in fact public. Following Christianity, it is personal. It is about a connection with God, but it's not private. And in fact, it is public. Paul's point to the church in Rome was you gotta tell somebody. They won't know if they're not told. Some of the words that are used to describe Christians were witnesses. We testify. We're ambassadors. We're sent we're those that carry hope. We're, we're to tell the world. If you, I'm, I'm trying to say this in love, but I'm trying to say it clearly. If you think you can completely and obediently follow Jesus and not tell other people that you want them to follow Jesus, you're not following Jesus. Jesus said, if you follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. If you're not fishing, you're not following well, it's about me and what God's doing in my life. Yes, and you were blessed to be a blessing. You've been saved, now you are sent. You are the church to go make a difference. It is not a private endeavor. Keith, I don't wanna scare him, I don't wanna over, okay, that's a whole separate talk, how we go about that. How we think about that. I know you don't wanna hurt anybody's feelings, you don't wanna ruin people, you don't wanna go out, you want strong on people, you don't wanna be a jerk, you don't wanna be obnoxious, and I love that if that's where you're at. But here's what I also know. I've said this for years. <laughs> I heard a joke the other day. They said, how do you know someone drives a Tesla? Because they'll tell you. <laughs> I think it's funny. <laughs> Here's the thing. What, what, what's behind that? What they're saying is, if they love the thing enough, they talk about the thing. No, nobody needs to be trained on how to talk about being a grandparent. You obnoxiously send out pictures on social media. How are you today? I'm good. Oh, did you ask about my grandkids? I didn't. Oh, here they are anyways. Because you love it, you believe it, and you want to tell. I, I understand that we've bought into this notion that following Jesus is just this private thing between me and God, but we have to know the truth so that we can say no to the lies. And one of the lies is it's just me and Jesus. It's just me and Jesus. No, it's not. God's plan A to reach the world is Christians. And listen to me, there is no plan B. You either are committed to tell people about Jesus as a Christian or you are an imposter as a Christian. One of the things I fear for the people of Grace Fellowship at times is we have lost our zeal to be inviters to our church and I get it, we've gone through and we still are in this thing called COVID and people are nervous and we don't know how people feel, I get that. And I'm not trying to say anything politically or health-wise about this, but guys, in the middle of all of this, the world keeps marching on and people die and people go to heaven and people go to hell. And we need to have an eternal urgency that says in the middle of all the chaos, my faith is not just me and God. 
I was saved to tell somebody, to make a difference, to be hopeful. It is personal. God does speak to me. God does move in me. He does that if you're a follower, but it's not private and it's public. Even baptism is saying something publicly to people about what God's done. Some of you have been a Christian, but you've never gone and gotten baptized. Why? Well, I don't like water. I'm, f- I'm afraid or I'm just scared or it's stupid. It's weird, whatever it is. And Jesus is like, it's not the point. The point is that you would let everyone know that you're in and you would go public with what he's done in your heart. We live in this world where somehow we've bought in that Christianity, like we sh- the non-Christian world says Christians should shut up because faith is just private. But yet some Christians in the Christian world would say, if we go public and if we make it out there, then that's rude. God would say, your faith, it's personal, but it's not private and it's to be public and you are to go tell. And it's a lie to believe that you can be a follower of Jesus and not do it. I would take a sip of my coffee and I would say, do you wanna keep going? (laughs) Hopefully you'd say yes. And then we go to point three and you say, you know what else I've noticed about this idea of Christianity is it, it feels like that people tell you if you're a Christian that you have to put your brain on the sideline. There's almost this subtext that comes from the university world and the scholastic world and thinkers that man, to be a Christian, you just must be someone who can't really read. Like you must've put science on the sideline. You must've put like history on the sideline. You must've put like all the other ways to process the world on the sideline because there's like this subtext that Christians are these people that are weak mentally and we don't have good reasons to believe what we believe. I know I've been in classes, I've been with family members, I've been with friends, I've been on trips where it comes up that they find out, they're, they kind of look at you, they're like, oh, you're a Christian? And they almost look at you like, man, I thought you were smart. They don't say that, but that's the feel like, how could you, how could you do that? How could you put your brain on the sideline? In fact, there's this lie that exists out there that I would say, yeah, that's not Christianity. And, I, and I, I'm, I'm gonna talk about the other side here in a second. So if you're a non-Christian, that's maybe where you are listening. But this is the lie that's out there that's not Christianity. It's that Christianity is for the unintelligent. That like really smart people aren't Christians. Really highly intellectual, well-read people are not Christians. That when you signed up to be a Christian, you just, you just, you just kind of had to put the books in the library on the sideline and you don't pay attention to things and you're not deep and you're not a good thinker. <laughs> just on a human level, a person of pride, that, that makes me wanna fight. I don't like them thinking I'm just a stupid person because I'm a follower of Jesus. But what I also know is that as I engage the truth of scripture and I know the truth so I can say no to the lies, I realize, listen to this, that I don't have to at all buy into the lie or belief that I'm unintelligent in being a Christian because I would say when I look around at the world, it points to the exact existence of the God I serve and worship. In fact, I think it enforces and sets us up to see intelligence. I wanna use the scripture for just a second. And when I show you this verse, you're gonna say, why in the heck did you pick that verse? But I just wanna use it as a template for a second to talk about this conversation, all right? This is Matthew chapter 28, verse one. Jesus has been crucified and he's been put in the tomb. After the Sabbath at dawn, the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. If you read the rest of the chapter, what you find out is the first two witnesses of the fact that Jesus had been buried and resurrected, the first two to find out that he's alive are two women. I've said this before on Easter, but if that's not true, that's the dumbest thing the story could have said. At this point in human history, a woman's testimony can't even be used in a court of law. If you were trying to launch a religion if you were trying to launch a worldview and a movement throughout the world that would change everything, the beginning of your story of the most pivotal event would not be that women saw it happen. People would say, that's insane. That's ridiculous. Why would you pick women? The people who wrote this were either high or it was true. I'll choose door two. 
In fact, what I wanna say to you as I work through this is, here's what the truth about Christianity is. Following Jesus requires faith, but that faith is not blind. It is not blind. The scriptures are absolutely clear that it is impossible to follow Jesus without faith. The scriptures are absolutely clear that, that you have to be a person of faith and believe in something. But faith is not always just this stupid, crazy thing. If you jump out of an airplane, it's stupid. If you jump out of an airplane with a parachute, it's deadly. But if you have a parachute on, it is not blind faith. You believe the parachute will do its job. And yes, you put faith in the parachute, but you have a bunch of reasons to do it because that's what parachutes do. When you read the Christian story and understand it, what you find out is you have to have faith, but there's a bunch of logical, intelligent reasons to have it. You could go through a bazillion of them, but just a few. The women being the first witnesses. The fact that when they wrote the New Testament, they said 500 people saw this Jesus guy raised from the dead. And by the way, they're still alive. Go talk to them. The one dude, Tom, he's on Straight Street. Go down, take a right. Third house on the left, go ask him. He was there. The disciples go from absolutely cowardice people to maniacs who go around the world, the majority of them being martyred for their faith. You don't get martyred for something that you know to be false. I've said this before, that the day of the week of worship changes from Saturday to, from Saturday to Sunday. And I said, I've been a pastor for 17 years. It's hard to get people to change anything religiously. And they changed virtually overnight. The fact that everything you long for in life as it relates to the way you want relationships to really be actually is verified by the scripture. Things like forgiveness, mercy, and kindness. Virtues that in every culture and every part of the world people seem to affirm over and over. It's almost as though we were designed intrinsically to see those things as beneficial. The fact that when the sun comes out and we look at it, we don't randomly think that just happened by chance. We look at it and say, man, that points and the science points to a divine creator behind it. The fact that your human experience is that people are evil and if you don't believe me, have kids. <laughs> and you think I'm joking, but you don't have to teach them how to lie. They intrinsically know how to do it and deceive. You spend so much time telling them to be honest and treat each other with kindness and respect because something is faulty inside of us. We all seem to have an understanding of what real biblical justice is when we get right down to it. When you go back and understand the real manuscript evidence that allowed the scriptures to be put together, I'm telling you, if you read Homer and you trust the Iliad or the Odyssey, you should trust the Bible. And I could keep going and keep going and keep going, but here's what I'm gonna tell you. It takes faith, but it is not stupid faith. There are a ton of logical reasons in God's grace that he has given us to say yes to him. It is a lie that says, man, you just need to put your brain on the sideline. Because I'm not, I'm not saying this to be braggadocious or for anything other than just to tell you this. I read a lot. I listen a lot. I pay attention. I try to grow and develop myself. And the more I read, the more I understand, the more I process the world, the older I get, the more confident I am that Jesus is true. Not less. And that's when I look at everything that goes on in the world. We've got to know the truth so we can say no to the lies. And I just want to press you. If you would say, I'm a non-Christian, I believe in God. I think it's crazy. I think y'all run around with a crutch and you don't believe it. I get that. I can respect that. But I would just lovingly push back and say, have you really investigated it? Have you really done the work? Have you really said, I'm going to roll up my sleeves and try to understand it? And man, if that's you and you're interested in that, our church will walk through that with you. No judgment, love, come alongside and have those conversations. And hopefully you would still have enough time at coffee for one more conversation. And you say, okay, that one was heavy. And I'd say, okay, maybe this one's not as heavy, but it's probably just as important as any of them we've said so far. And it's really important that I, we get this in in this series before we go away. And it's something that we talk a lot about grace and hear at grace. And it's something that you hear spoken of, but, but I hear it by Christians and non-Christians. And it's in essence, what's the essence of Christianity? And when I hear people talk about what it means to be a Christian, they, they say some version of this. It's about being a good person. It's about doing the right thing. 
You know, people, when they wanna make themselves feel like they're good in a good space, they're like, Keith, I'm a good person. I try to do the right person. I don't, I don't rob banks. I pay my taxes. I, I, you know, I, I try to take care of my kids. I coach Little League. I do all this stuff, Keith. I keep a job. People go through this idea that, you know, I don't, I don't drink too much unless it's a special occasion and I'm a noble citizen and I'm better than the, my brother. He's an idiot. And so I'm, I'm doing really good. And in essence, listen to me, what you buy into is that Christianity, hear this, is simply morality and religion. What you buy into is that Christianity is about working your way to God. And here's what is not Christianity. And I I hope you get this. Even if you've been a Christian a long time, make sure you see this. Here's what's not Christianity. It is not Christianity to say that the basis of following Jesus is my behavior. You think Christianity is just about being a moral, good person. I'm gonna work my way to God. I'm gonna be enough good and I will be good. We've said here at this church before, you can't good your way to God. You can't be good enough. You can't get it right. We are all guilty. We all fall short. And even if you sense that, you say, okay, I'll just be good enough. I'll be good enough. I'll make the scales go in the right direction. But I wanna remind you what Paul said in Ephesians. Something so important that we have to understand why this idea is a lie. Here's what he says in Ephesians chapter two, eight and nine. For it is by grace you have been saved. How are you transformed? It is by the grace of God through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It's the gift of God. In fact, here's here's what he's gonna say here in a second. Listen to me. He's gonna say that the basis of your faith is not your behavior, but his. His. That the confidence you have as a Christian is not rooted in what you do, but what he did. What he's saying is that Christianity is not advice on how to behave. It's news about what God already did. In fact, he continues and he says this. It's not by works. It's not by works so that nobody can boast. No one gets to walk into any church anywhere on the planet and go, you know why I'm good with God? because of what I did. Read my Bible this week. (laughs) Prayed. Homeless guy, 270, hooked him up. You can't say any of that. The Bible even goes so far as to say this. Your most righteous acts are filthy rags compared to God's holiness. There's nothing we can do. Praise God, Jesus already did it. So here's really what Christianity is. It's not based on the basis of our behavior at all. Here's what Christianity is. We behave from acceptance, not for acceptance. We behave from acceptance, not for acceptance. We respond, come on, get this. We respond to God because he already loves us. We don't act for God so that he will love us. Uh Uh-uh, we respond. We worship, we try to live righteously. We try to get it right. Not to be religious, but in response to what God has done. Man, if you think you can be moral enough, you are kidding yourself. Please, please, please hear me say this. Morality, it may get you a great job. Morality may keep you from being grounded by your parents and morality may keep you from going to prison someday, but it is only the blood of Jesus that'll keep you out of hell. Because you and I can't do it. And you need to know the truth so you can say no to the lies. And here's the truth. We behave because we've been accepted and forgiven by God, not so we will be accepted and forgiven by God. And I'm I'm telling you this because this is huge. For some of you, the reason your Christian experience is lousy and frustrating and exhausting and tiring is you are trying to earn what God has already freely given. I say this a lot as your pastor. God does not love you more this week based on how you behaved. He loves you as much as he can, regardless of what you did or did not do. But somehow the non-Christian world and even the Christian world has bought into that what Christianity really is. Christianity is this idea that I'm supposed to just do good and do good and do good and do good and then God will be happy with me. Nope. We do good because God in his grace has already chosen to die for us and save us. And we embrace that and we respond to that mercy. 
not so we will be saved, but because we're saved. And we would get to the end of coffee and I would say, I know you're running late. I'm running late. And I would just look at you and I would say, man, if you don't wanna turn to myths and you wanna make sure you know the truth so you can say no to the lies, I, I, would, I would just remind you of this incredible reality. And it's just this, that the more you know the truth, the more you know the truth. The more you know scripture, the more you'll get connected to Jesus. The more you know the truth of God's word, you'll be sanctified by his truth and you will fall in love with the one who is the way and the life. You will fall in love with the one who has come to die for you. The more you connect to the author and perfecter of your faith, it'll happen as you are sanctified by God's truth. The more you know the truth, the more you will connect to the truth. I was thinking about this series and I get it, man. It's, gosh, are we inundated with messages? What's true, what's not true, what's real, what's not real, what should I believe, what should I not believe? And it's happening in every area of our life. And yet, as I think about this series, one of the reasons I'm confident in preaching a series and going through a talk like this weekend or the other talks that we've gone through is because God in his grace has chosen to show us who he is. And we can know. In fact, here's, here's the assignment that I wanna have for this weekend. And I would just ask everybody, if you're a Christian, it should hopefully be easy that you wanna do this. And if you're a non-Christian, that you would consider it. And it's right now, what I want you to do is to intentionally, like on purpose, consider the goodness of God. Guys, God did not need us but he wants us. God did not have to give us his word, but he did. God did not have to choose to indwell us the moment we begin to follow him, but he has chosen in his grace to send his spirit. God did not have to take us from being blind, but he has chosen to give us sight. God did not have to die for us, but he did. God did not have to make himself knowable to you, but he did. And there is a reality that as we go through a series like this in a world where what's true, what's not true, one of the things that we should just pause and do is go, man, it is amazing that God in his goodness would say, I'm gonna let you know the truth. I'm gonna let you know the truth. I'm gonna make it known. I'm gonna give you this. I'm gonna give you my spirit. I'm gonna put it out there. Just, just contemplate that. Just consider that God, as <laughs> God did that. You know, there's an expression that I hear people say sometimes in different settings. They'll say the phrase, how cool is that? How cool is that? I was with my son at a ball game the other day and foul ball went and this guy got it, but he saw my son and he gave me the ball for my son. How cool is that? Man, I got to go on this trip and it was like a great deal and I got to spend it with my friends. And while we were there, we ran into some of our best friends, even though we were in another part of the world. How cool is that? Man, we were able to buy this house. It was the house of our dreams and we've always wanted that. And the market price was crazy high, but it's somehow by God's grace, we got it low and we got the house. How cool is that? You're on a drive and you turn the corner and the sun just comes up over the horizon and you see and you look and it's breathtaking. How, how cool is that? How about this? The creator of the universe who is holy and perfect and worthy of all praise sees you, knows every single hair on your head, everything you've done, everything you will do. He looks at you and says, I want a relationship with you. I invite you into my kingdom. I have provided a way through Jesus. I wanna make you a part of the family. I wanna save you. I wanna send you. I wanna use you and I wanna be with you forever. How cool is that? It is amazing to think about the goodness of God and how much it shows up day after day. And one of the ways that God is incredibly good is in a world full of confusion and chaos and myths and lies. 
God has chosen to show us the truth through his word, through the word. If you're a follower of Jesus, I hope that you just embrace that and get excited about God alone and what he's done in your life. And if you're not a follower of God, I hope that you've leaned into this series and you would listen in and you would contemplate the realities of this God that in his grace recognizes your legitimate and real questions, sees your doubts and doesn't berate you or condemn you, but came to save you and wants to meet you where you are. Let's pray together. Father God, so much here and yet so much at stake. Our propensity to buy into lies and to turn to myths, to not do the work of being sanctified by your truth, to, to get confused, to not draw near. So God, in all of this, I pray that this entire series would be something that would move in us to bring us back to your truth. What you've revealed, your goodness, your love. And God, in all of it that we would, as we started, we would know you more. God, for those that are far, that you would do what I could never do, which is you would bring them to understand with clarity who you are. Give them ears to hear and eyes to see and a heart that is open to receive that truth. God, right now, across our church, let us worship you through song as the Holy One, the Worthy One, who is different from everything else in all of existence. We pray this in the name of Jesus.